Today, we will talk about the neuroscience of happiness. Long before anyone conceived of the neuroscience of happiness, Americans recognized a fundamental right to the pursuit of happiness. As a matter of fact, the pursuit of happiness was enshrined in the Declaration of Independence as a key reason why we should fund the country, found the country in the first place. Now, almost 250 years after the Declaration, it is time to assess how we have been doing. How have we exercised this right? How are we doing with happiness? Are we just pursuing happiness, or have we managed to capture it yet, maybe? And to assess this, we will uh, look at um, um, the development of happiness, reported happiness, over time. Of course, we don't have data for the entire almost 250-year period, but we do have reliable data for the last 60 years or so. So on the x-axis, we will plot time in years. On the y-axis, we will plot uh, reported life happiness. And the people were asked every year, how happy are you? Where one is unhappy, three is happy, and two is somewhere in between, neutral. And we'll plot that in blue. On a second y-axis, we'll plot GDP per capita in inflation adjusted dollars. And we'll plot that in red. And if you do that, you will see that um, there has been a tremendous rise in the standards of living in the last 60 years or so. People are not now much more wealthy than they were in 1946. In 1946, the average income was about $10,000, inflation adjusted, and today it is almost $45,000. Now, how about happiness? How did happiness develop over the same, same time period? Well, if you do that, if you look at that, then you will recognize that happiness levels have stagnated over the same time period. People today are no more happy than they were in 1946. And so the first thing to note is that there seems to be no relationship between material wealth and mental wealth. And the question is, why is that the case? To understand why that is the case, we need to consider the conditions in the outside world. And I'm going to revisit someone who already did this for us. He explored this in his treatise on the sufferings of the world. Schopenhauer talks about this in detail. And I want to read you one quote from this treatise. Compare the respective feelings of two animals, one of which is engaged in eating the other. And the point is that there's an imbalance here. The first animal that's doing the eating derives less pleasure from that act than the second animal that is being eaten, eaten incurs suffering. So there's a fundamental imbalance. And if you read this essay, which I recommend you doing, you will see that this seems to be common throughout the world, throughout the conditions in general. So it seems to be generally the case. So what are we up against? Right, it looks like that happiness is just outnumbered by suffering. Okay? Suffering is just much more likely than happiness, which is rare. And you know this to be the case because there's also a psychological mechanism that even increases the imbalance. So for instance, if you gain $20, your increase in happiness is less than the suffering that you experience when you lose $20. And so now the question is, you know, why this is the case? And ironically, of course, uh, this makes the pursuit of happiness even more desirable because you can't just expect happiness to happen randomly because by ch just by chance, you're more likely to suffer than to be happy. So this makes the pursuit of happiness more worthwhile. And the question, however, is why is the suffering so pronounced? And the reality is that there is actually something even more insidious going on than that, which are the conditions of the outside world. And what's more insidious than that is going inside, on inside of you. And one of these mechanisms is a so-called hedonic treadmill. The idea is that we are all desperately trying to improve our station in life, to alleviate this terrible suffering. But every time we uh, achieve a new level in this game of life, um, the treadmill brings us right back down. We just have to keep doing that just to stay in the same place. Another way of expressing this is the hedonic ratchet. The idea is that if you crank something up, uh, once you achieve a new level of material wealth, you will no longer experience that as pleasurable or positive. You'll just take that for granted. And deviations from that downward, you will actually experience a suffering as opposed to continuing to experience the 
the uh, pleasure from the gain. Now, why is that the case? To understand why that is the case, we have to consider neurobiology. Specifically, we have to consider the mesolimbic dopamine system. As the name suggests, the mesolimbic dopamine system is in the center of the brain, and it you know, supplies uh, structures that are subcortical, like the nucleus accumbens, and also the frontal cortex with dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. Now, the details of this are in dispute. For instance, there is a dispute right now whether um, neurologically or neuroscientifically, wanting is the same as liking. There's also a dispute if other neurotransmitters like anandamide, which is an endogenous cannabinoid neurotransmitter, is also involved in the feeling of pleasure. But what is not in dispute is that this system is central to things like motivation, reward, pleasure, and emotions like that. And so how do we know that? Well, we know that because, for instance, if you take a rat and you implant an electrode in the mesolimbic dopamine system of the rat that allows to stimulate this system and release dopamine, and then you give the rat control over this electrode so the rat can self-stimulate. What the rat will do is that the rat will just keep doing that. It will just trigger, self-stimulate the system. It will forego eating, sleeping, sex, until it drops. Okay? So this system does seem to be very, very involved with motivation, reward, probably is involved in things like developing addictions, compulsions. To really understand the hedonic treadmill, we need to go even deeper than that. We need to consider the activity levels of a single neuron in this system. So we'll, we'll do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the activity level of a single neuron in the system over time. And um, so if we do that, so we're recording from a single neuron in the system. And what you see here is that uh, over time, the activity levels of that neuron somewhat fluctuates. But at some point, something extraordinary is happening that uh, increases the activity of that neuron dramatically. In this case, what happened is that we del delivered a reward to the animal, in this case, a food reward. And that made this neuron fire more. It increased its activity level dramatically. Okay? So that's, that's fine. It's what we would expect from what we already know about the system. But if we do a second experiment where we condition the animal to expect the reward by a cue, so if we always deliver a cue before we deliver the reward, what happens is that now the activity has shifted. This uh, reward signal is now happening right after the cue. It's no longer happening after the reward. The reward has already been priced in because the animal knows how to, that to, ex to expect it. And you can use all kinds of things as a cue. You can use uh, light, you can use sounds. As long as it's cons as consistent mapping so the animal knows what to expect, you will see this behavior of the neurons. So what's important to note is that the activity has shifted leftward. The, there's no more longer an increase for the reward itself. It's already all doing it for the cue. Now what happens in a third experiment, if you take an animal that has been such conditioned, and if we deliver the cue, but we don't deliver the reward that the animal has been expecting. If we do that, something interesting happens. Namely, you still get the uh, activity increase for the cue because the animal doesn't know yet it's going to be cheated out of a reward. The neuron's activity level will actually dip below the baseline um, firing rate. So in a sense, the neuron feels cheated. I mean, we don't want to anthropomorphize, but the neuron feels cheated out of this reward. And probably the animal experiences this as suffering. Okay? So that is the neurological basis that we believe underlies this hedonic treadmill. Now, a lot of people have a hard time believing this. So I want to relate to you the findings of a seminal study where people looked at the happiness levels of lottery winners on the one hand, and the happiness levels of people who had been in a horrific accident that rendered them quadriplegic on the other hand. And if you ask most people what they would expect about the happiness levels of these groups, most people would say, well, you know, the people who won the lottery are probably happier than the people who end up in a wheelchair, right? But if you do the study, and if you ask these people about their happiness, and if you do this about six months after the incident, the respective incidents, what is remarkable at the, is that these groups are virtually indistinguishable. Their happiness levels are very close. If anything, uh, the people who won the lottery uh, report lower levels of everyday happiness than controls. And it's easy to see why. Let's say you won the lottery. That's going to raise your expectations quite a bit. And you'll basically expect perfection 
in all things from now on. So there's a lot of you know, ways when things go wrong. So you won the lottery, you're summering in the Hamptons, and the temperature in the pool is not just so. Well, that's very upsetting, right? So that's not a problem that the people in the wheelchair group have, for instance. So now it all comes together. We, all, we now understand why this, uh, this increase in material wealth does not lead to, a, to an increase in mental wealth. Um, the idea is that the system is constantly recalibrating itself. And it's actually quite ironic because the more forcefully you pursue happiness, the more elusive it will be. You will not reach it that way. Because every time you reach the carrot in this case, it will be you know, uh, raised ever so slightly. And then you're, the, the carrot is as, uh, you know, as distant as it was before. And so it's actually the other way around. It's not that the uh, pursuit of happiness gives you happiness. It's that the pursuit of happiness drives the increase in economic wealth that we've been seeing. So you're going to get wealthier, but you're not going to get happier. And of course, you all know that this is true, because everyone listening here has a higher standard of living, guaranteed than any king that was alive when the Declaration of Independence was written. Yet, most of you don't feel like a king. Some do, but most don't. And so the idea is that uh, it is actually folly to expect that future increases in material wealth will finally translate in happiness. That's not realistic given 250 years of history, almost 250 years of history. So is there a way to achieve happiness? Is there another way? Well, it turns out there is. And this approach was pioneered already in antiquity by uh, philosophers, um, usually Stoic philosophers actually, and people like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca. And what they suggest to do, what a, a key tenet of what you should do to achieve happiness is comes down to expectation management. You should manage your expectations. Um, so for instance, Marcus Aurelius, who wrote The Meditations, which is probably one of the first, if not the first, self-help book, um, suggested that every day when he gets up, he will recognize what a privilege it is just to be alive. And he's right. That is a considerable privilege. And it turns, also turns out to work every time he does that because by the definition, every time he still manages to wake up, he can do that. The second thing that is remarkable that he's doing just after he was recognized how grateful he should be to just be alive is that he anticipates that today there's going to be suffering today. And this is rem remarkable because he's the emperor at that point. He has a pretty good life, but he anticipates that bad things will happen today. And not in a dreadful way, like, oh my god, no. He says, bad things will happen, but given the nature of the world, that's just to be expected. That's okay. So he accepts that bad things will happen, but that's okay. And so he anticipates suffering. And if it happens, he already expected it. And if the bad things don't happen. If good things happen, well, that's just gravy, so he can be happy about that, OK? And so he ex escapes this hedonic treadmill that we are all caught in. I mean, most of us, to give you, to give you uh, another example of this, I mean, a classic case is uh, when a wireless internet became available on planes. People were very excited. They uh, you know, posted about it on Facebook in flight, OK? How excited they are about the wireless internet. Today, a couple years later, no one is excited about that anymore. People just recognize the downsides of that, like, okay, it's not working, or it, the connection is slow, it's kind of expensive, but you're totally, uh, you know, taking for granted this amazing feat of uh, technology that Marcus Reyes himself could never even have conceived of. So expectation management is critical. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, the, the lack of expectations are actually what uh, is one of the key reasons why children are able to be so happy with, with so little. Because they're children, or babies in this case, they have so few expectations about the world, they don't really know what to expect, that something very simple, like this child here seeing his mother, makes him so happy that someone like us, who have lived for a long time, to achieve a comparable level of happiness, it would take a lot to make us that happy as this child. Because, because we've already cranked our hedonic ratchet over 9,000 times in our lifetime. So, you know, we are way up, way up there, but no, no more happy. So, how does this all come together? What should we do to become happy or to be happy? The first thing we already discussed in detail, expectation management is, is critical. So you can either have, either have static expectations, you, 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 you take things for granted, or you can have dynamic expectations where you really deliberately try to override this and say, I'm not going to expect anything, or 
If anything, I'm going to expect bad things to happen. The second dimension, and we have really, in the interest of time, not being able to talk much about this, is the contrast between doing and receiving. And I'll make it more clear with an example. Um, basically, the idea is that um, people who are engaged in things that uh, where their abilities match the demands of the task, people have reported very high levels of happiness with that. And on, on top of that, this kind of happiness is a happiness that the Greeks recognize on top of the one that we already discussed. So the happiness that we have discussed so far, they called hedonia or pleasure. This kind of happiness is more eudaimonia or the a sense of meaning. So for instance, if a surgeon does a very demanding surgery, but he's very well trained to do that, and he has a happy outcome, he will be very happy about that. That contrasts starkly with someone who just is given, who, who receives a million dollars because he won the lottery. That person will not be as happy. The third uh, dimension to consider, which is somewhat related to the second one, but conceptually different, is what we, what we focus on. Do we conceive of happiness as a process that we have to do every day, like Marcus Aurelius does every day? Or is it something that is like one and done? We do it once, and we can be happy ever after. And if you think of those three dimensions, you will recognize that there is at least eight quadrants where happiness could be hiding. And the question is, have we been looking for happiness in the right quadrant? Now, many people suggest, for instance, all advertising suggests that happiness is in this quadrant. The idea is that if you buy our product, you, you will be more happy than if you didn't. Uh, that's, otherwise, there's no reason to buy it. But you know, you buy the product, and you'll be happily, happy ever after. That's the idea. And um, research suggests that's the wrong quadrant to look for. Happiness is actually hiding over here. You have to keep your expectations low, or at least not take anything for granted. You need to be doing things, and you need to keep doing that. There's no happily ever after. You need to do that every day. All right, so to summarize, if you're serious about the pursuit of happiness, and serious not just about the pursuit, but also to finally achieve happiness as opposed to just pursuing it, it is probably wise and advisable to consider the neuroscience of happiness. And if you do that, I think we have a fair chance of being able to establish a truly happy nation. Thank you very much.